Jalen Withers numbers at Louisville don't exactly jump off the page at you, but is it possible he was just a victim of the circumstances around him? And if so, would he be a good addition for the Tar Heels? You are Locked on Tar Heels, your daily podcast on the UNC Tar Heels, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, it's Tuesday, April 11th, 2023. Welcome into the Locked on Tar Heels podcast. We are the only daily North Carolina show out there. I'm your host, Isaac Shade, and I want to welcome you in and thank you for joining us. We've been spending a lot of time lately looking at the transfer portal and potential players that Carolina might pluck right on out of there. Why? Because the Tar Heels still have five scholarships available right now, and we're trying to figure out who it might be that's going to come join the show in Chapel Hill. There's been a lot of talk about Harrison Ingram. We're going to get you an update on that here in just a little bit. We also got a a schedule update for 2023-24 season. We'll provide you that later on in the show, as well as some numbers to maybe help cleanse the palate that the Tar Heels aren't the only ones going through what they're going through in the transfer portal. But before we get to any of that, I do want to look at Jalen Withers. He is a player that's been connected to Carolina in the transfer portal. And there's been some even more like noise and rumor and movement over the weekend and into Monday. And so I thought, you know, it's probably time we take a more serious look at Jalen Withers. And here's where I want to start with this. When the, the rumors of Jalen Withers in North Carolina started last week. I, I looked at his stats. I, I remember him from Carolina playing them, and I thought, you know, not impressed. I hope he doesn't come to Carolina. That, that was my first thought. Just that was my gut reaction. And then on Monday, with this becoming a little bit more of a reality, I thought, well, let me, if this is going to be a thing, let me dive more into his numbers, dive more into his story and figure out more of what might be going on. And here's what I want to tell you. While I was initially like, yeah, I think Jalen Withers is a guy that the Tar Heels need to take a shot on, take a chance with whatever you want to say. So let's talk about it. Let's look at why I think that and why it doesn't make sense to think that on the surface. Because again, me from the beginning was like, no, I don't want him. And now I'm changing my story a little bit. Let's talk about it. So uh, he is, Jalen Withers is initially from Charlotte. So there's that natural kind of tie in back to the Carolina area. The reason for that though, his dad played at UNC Charlotte. I say played, was a stud at UNC Charlotte. Um, who 6'8 forward, 1,750 career points. 1,042 career rebounds for dad, for Curtis Withers, averaged 15 points and 8.9 rebounds for his career. Great stuff. As for Jalen himself, he's a little bit bigger than daddy. 6'9", 220, listed as something of a stretch four, which is something we know Carolina needs, that shooting. Uh, But as you dig more into his story, came out of high school as a three, and, and more thinks of himself at a three. We'll talk about the four in a minute. He's been at Louisville for four years, so he would be transferring what on the surface seems like just his COVID year, but hang on there. He redshirted his freshman year at Louisville, and so already had another year of eligibility. So actually has his redshirt senior year and and his COVID year still to be able to use. So he should be able to have two years of eligibility if he wants them, and if Carolina wants them. Let's look at three-point shooting, because that's what we've been talking about. Carolina needs shooters, and particularly shooters from deep, who can change the narrative a little bit from what we saw last year. Uh, Having a stretch four that that is proficient beyond the arc, as we've seen the difference between Brady Manick and Pete Nance. Not that Pete Nance isn't proficient, because he can make the shot, but not at a Brady Manic level or volume, like Brady Manic volume or percentage of making the shots. And that just wasn't Pete last year. Now, I'm not saying that's Jalen Withers, but bear with me. Let's dive into this. He shot really well from three this most recent season, despite Louisville being 
honestly awful, right? We've t- we've talked about that a little bit. He shot 41.7% from three last year to lead the Cardinals. But at just three attempts per game, a total of he made 40 out of 96. It's not exactly high volume. Didn't even make, didn't even attempt triple digits. So the question with that, as you look at the possibility of Jalen Withers, is that scalable to more volume? Uh, 150 attempts, 200 attempts, um, even more, 250. You know, what What does that look like? That's a good question and something we don't have the answer to because that's the most he's ever attempted in a season. He had a sh- solid freshman season from deep, did Jalen Weathers, 38.1%. That was on just 21 attempts, way even fewer. And his sophomore year, the year in between, this is where the small sample size starts to get you. Had those, the 38.1% his freshman year, 41.7% last year, but his sophomore year, just 23.4% from three on only 2.2 attempts per game. He was 15 of 64 for the season. And so that leaves me with all sorts of question marks. That's Part of the reason why initially I was out. Additionally, this past year, here, here's a couple, I don't know about Jalen Withers I things from this past year. He's inconsistent scoring-wise. Last season for Louisville, 13 games where he scored in double digits. 12 games where he scored seven points or fewer. And you have to ask yourself, is that a product of him or is that a product of Louisville just being as bad as they were last season? Another eh, with him is Withers had 71 turnovers in just 32 in 32 games last year. That's 2.2 turnovers per game. He also doesn't project to be the world's best defender. We'll just say it that way. But here's where I want to give you some context. Here's what you have to determine from looking at Jalen Withers' three years of playing at Louisville. Is he the player that averaged 10 points a game and 7.7 boards per game his ACC all-freshman season? Playing out of position, mind you, already that year. Or is he the player that struggled mightily last year when Chris Mack left midseason? Or is he the player that that rebounded-ish this year under Kenny Payne didn't have his freshman year numbers, but got closer to them. And again, some of that inconsistency we just looked at. Who is the real Jalen Withers? I don't know that we know from his last three years of playing at Louisville. Is he more that freshman or is he more what he did his sophomore year or the somewhere in between of his junior year? Also, as I kind of have alluded to, Withers was moved around quite a bit positionally throughout his Louisville career. As I've said, he came in as a self-described small forward, played power forward, and then went to center. And and that's where he's spent a lot of his time until this this most recent season. He was finally unlocked to be able to get back out to the perimeter where he feels most comfortable. The result is 41.7% from three. Again, on fewer than 100 attempts for the season, but you look at the context of Louisville in total, there's part of it. Also, also... He was coming off a knee injury coming into last year, so you wonder at what level of health he fully got to. Like, will he be more ready for wherever he's going next? And is it, just like we said about Caleb Love, literally yesterday on the show, is next, it just feels like oftentimes getting out of a situation where you just didn't feel like you were at your best, those green pastures, the fresh start, whatever phrase you want to put on it, you, you just are able to do more and be in a better position. Is that is that what he would be coming into at North Carolina with more talent around him, things of that nature? So I would say right now, as I look at this, ultimately Jalen Withers is a depth add more than someone you project as a starter for North Carolina. If he's okay with that, or at least having to fight for a starting job, right? Like, Maybe it's he and Harrison Ingram come in and between them and Jalen Washington, they all kind of battle it out for obviously Washington's not going to be the three, but those three guys kind of battle it out for the three and four positions. And I mean, you're still looking at 
Like, is Dalton Connect a possibility? Nick Timberlake, does he play the tooth or whatever? So there's still a lot to do, a lot to figure out out there. But with five scholarships available, you feel like maybe you can take a risk on Jalen Withers, that he he's not the guy from his sophomore year that was out of position. He is more the guy that was an all-ACC freshman, his freshman year, already playing out of position. What What can he do? So at some point you'll run out of scholarships, but if this is your guy and you as a coaching staff feel like he has something key that he can contribute and add, you go get him and and you make it happen. But again, is he more than what he's shown because of the circumstances he was put in at Louisville because of the context? Is it worth taking a shot? Seems like it to me. And where would coach Davis play him? Would he put him at the three? Would he put him at a, I don't even know that you have to call it small ball four at, at six nine. You know, you could just call that a regular four. But keep in mind, Leaky Black was playing the three at six nine last year. And what does what does he do wherever you put him? Um, does does he get does he keep shooting over forty percent from three? If so, sign me up, especially if it's scalable. That's what I'm watching for. Well, in the midst of all that, you just heard me talk about Harrison Ingram again. Is he coming to North Carolina? Well, we got some other blue blood news about him on Monday that we now have to consider. But at least one recruiting analyst thinks he is going to be a Tar Heel. And it was the one that broke Gigi Jack's decommitting from North Carolina. So maybe there's something to listen to there. We'll look at it in just a second. But first, this episode is brought to you by our friends at FanDuel. Grand slams, no hitters, and double plays are back. No better place to get the MLB action than at FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Because right now, new customers, you can step up to the plate with a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. You go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up, place your first bet, and get up to $1,000 in bonus bets if you don't win. What would uh, you be able to place in these early weeks of the MLB season? You want to look ahead? You want to get in on tonight's action? Go ahead. Do it. Don't miss your chance to get that no sweat first bet up to $1,000 when you join FanDuel today. Go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. Make every moment more with FanDuel, official partner of Major League Baseball. Love it. I am a big baseball fan, and so I love that baseball is back, and it's great. All right, we just talked about the potential of Jalen Withers coming to North Carolina. Let's also continue to dive in on Harrison Ingram. We led the show with him uh, last week and and talked about it, and it seems like there's been even more traction since then that that stuff is headed potentially in North Carolina's favor. So on Monday, Jamie Shaw put out basically on three's version of a crystal ball that he was – putting in Carolina as the favorite to land Harrison Ingram. Uh, It's funny because of my role, you might be aware that in addition to our show, I am also one of the co-hosts of Locked On College Basketball. And so I've had tons of schools reach out to me to be like, or some of the other hosts that are like, hey, any any chance we've got with Harrison Ingram? And I just keep telling them, oh, that's cute. No, the Tar Heels are going to get him. So like uh, the Houston coach asked me the... Uh, USC's coach, not Houston's coach, Houston's host asked me, USC's host asked me, I've had multiple others. And uh, it, it seems like at this point, the momentum is in North Carolina's favor. Kansas was the vibe early. It, it felt like that's where more of the emphasis was leaning. Um, but since then, not that the Kansas noise has cooled off so much as Carolina has just rushed forth in the Harrison Ingram conversation. So now it's UNC and Michigan is trying to make a big push. Come on, man. We're going to beat Michigan on this one. We're not going to lose Caleb Love to Michigan and then lose this recruiting battle to Michigan. No, get out of here, Juwan Howard, with that. Um, But here's the thing that happened on Monday. Joe Tipton, also part of that whole um, network of people, reported that on Monday, Harrison Ingram spoke to both John Calipari, Kentucky's coach, and Bill Self, Kansas' coach. Now, 
the depth of those conversations, the content of those conversations, we're not privy to at this point. We just know that some conversation happened. For all I know, it was him telling, it was Harrison Ingram saying to those guys, hey, really appreciate your interest. I'm going to Carolina, right? Like Kansas has been in the mix. He talked to Bill Self again on Monday. We we don't know what those conversations were. That could just be a way to get more interest from from uh, Joe Tipton. And if so, I'm literally doing that by talking with us about it right now. Um, from everything that I'm reading in the tea leaves, it seems like Carolina is very much the favorite. You can never count out John Calipari when he gets into the mix on something like this, but yeah, I mean, you just look at what's available for Harrison Ingram to play on the way Carolina's roster is made up right now. He can have all the minutes he he wants and be surrounded by other talented and returning college basketball players. And so it just makes sense to me for him to stay there. But, you know, Bill Self could continue to hold some sway. Maybe he's able to make a latch piss, uh, latch last ditch effort to land Harrison Ingram to pull him back from North Carolina. Um, and, and you don't know where he was at in his, in his processing in, in his thinking as he had these conversations. So um, I, but I firmly believe that what Harrison Ingram brings at the wing could be invaluable for Carolina this year, experience, playmaking, smart kid, good kid, like uh, just lots of stuff like that has two years left has only played two years at Stanford. Um, really, I thought he would be gone after his first year, but came back wanting to, to make a step forward. Didn't take as much of a step forward as he hoped to. And so now is entering the transfer portal with opportunities to do things. What the concern I voiced about him the other day, Harrison Ingram, and I'll say it again, he's not got the three point shooting that's desired. His freshman year, 31.3%. Last year, his sophomore year, 31.9%. And that's on 3.6 attempts per game. And then this year, 3.4 attempts per game. And so um, there's nothing that you look at with that and say, oh, yeah, you're going to just project into this much higher level three-point shooter all of a sudden. Except Carolina has had that before with a sophomore turning into a junior. Now, this is somebody that's been in Carolina's program that whole time, but took a massive leap forward from beyond the arc heading into his junior year and parlayed that into the ACC player of the year and ultimately a national championship. And uh, so that's a thing. And yes, I am talking about Justin Jackson, Justin Jackson, his first year at Carolina, 30.4% from three on 2.4 attempts per game. His sophomore year, dropped to 29.2% on three attempts a game. But his junior year, remember that summer in between, he went to the NBA and found out, oh, you don't want me because I can't shoot. I got to learn how to shoot better and consistently. Came back his junior year. You know, remember what he did? 37% from three on 7.1 attempts per game. That leap is insane to me. Like anytime I look at those numbers, 29.2% his sophomore year, 37% his junior year. Not only that, but his attempts went up four per game in the process. So impressed with Justin Jackson's junior year progress. And I'm not saying that Harrison Ingram will do that. I'm saying he could. And that's a big part of why he'll still be in school is if I want to make the NBA, I got to prove that I can hit from outside consistently and at, at a at a high volume at the same time. Carolina is a great place with lots of shots for him to come and do that while not having to stand out in the same way he did at Stanford. This is a more even playing field in terms of talent. So Hubert Davis has to ward off these other teams, sniffing around, get them out of here, convince Harrison Ingram to come to North Carolina. Honestly, I wanted him out of high school. I wanted him the first time around coming out of Dallas, but hey, he chose Stanford. Now you got a chance to go get him again on the rebound. So why not do it? And if his three-point shooting can match the other intangibles and basketball things that he brings, I'm all sorts of in on Harrison Ingram. So we'll keep our eyes peeled for this if anything happens on social media. Now, I've said that multiple times while losing six to the portal is frustrating and painful, in some ways, that's the norm of college basketball. 
now in the transfer portal era. Here's the thing. I've now got numbers to back it up and prove it and hopefully help us sleep better at night and a schedule update for the upcoming men's college basketball season. We'll talk about all of that in just a second. All right, as we wrap today, I want to start uh, with looking ahead to some schedule things that we learned on Monday, and then we'll talk uh, a little bit more about um, a a report about the sheer number of people in the transfer portal. It is mind-boggling. Can't wait for you to hear those numbers. So we talked last week about the 2024 Maui Invitational Field, which Carolina will participate in. This Thanksgiving week, 2023, they will be in the battle for Atlantis. You might recall that I alluded to that on yesterday's show as we talked about Caleb Love. We don't yet have the bracket for that field, but I realized uh, that I didn't actually lay out the teams that will be in that field. So let me tell you that. And then I'll tell you one specific opponent that we already know for Carolina elsewhere this upcoming season. So North Carolina, obviously in the battle for Atlantis and they're joined by alphabetically Arkansas, Memphis, Michigan, which could play Caleb love. If that comes to fruition, Northern Iowa, Stanford, which that could be uh, playing. If Harrison Ingram comes playing his old team, Texas tech, if <laughs> Kerwin Walton's still on that roster, could play them and play him. And then Villanova rounds out that field this Thanksgiving um, break. So pretty good field. Northern Iowa is really the only one that you look at and is like, okay. And maybe a little bit of Stanford too, but the rest of those, uh, you expect Villanova to be back next year to a, at least some degree, some level. And obviously playing Michigan would be very interesting in that. Now, As to the matchup that we already knew who the Tar Heels are going to play, it's another field with Carolina and Michigan both in it, and that is the 2023 Jumpman Invitational. We learned from John Rothstein on Monday what uh, those pairings are going to be. You might recall this past season was the inaugural Jumpman Invitational. The four schools involved, all Jordan schools, North Carolina, Michigan, Oklahoma, and Florida. Last season the pairings were North Carolina and Michigan and then Florida and Oklahoma so this season the Tar Heels are going to play the Sooners OU there you go and so that obviously means then that Michigan and Florida will be matching up and while they didn't come out and report this by process of elimination we know what next year's pairings will be as well so the Tar Heels will round off this three-year rotation by facing Florida next season while Michigan and Oklahoma play. So that'll be in the 2024 Jumpman Invitational there. Okay, let's move back to the transfer portal because this is really interesting to me. I know we, and I've fallen into this some in the past couple of weeks as well, as we look at Carolina losing six players to the transfer portal, um, not far behind is Kansas with five. I believe Louisville has six. So there's other high major schools that are right there with the Tar Heels. And you start to feel like, are we the only ones? Are we out here on an island? Are other schools experiencing this? Well, I just named a couple other for you. But until you look at the full math of that, it just kind of feels anecdotal. And you want some actual numbers proof. Like, all right, Isaac, you've been telling me this. Prove to me that it is a thing happening around the country. Well, here's all the proof you need. You ready? I'll tell it to you in one sentence, and then we'll unpack it further. Over 20% of last year's Division I scholarship players are in the transfer portal this offseason. And that, that number is a week old at this point. So here, here it is broken down. This season, there were 363 teams in Division One. It's absurd, right? So many. As you know from what we often talk about on the show, you can have as many as 13 scholarships that you hand out. You don't have to hand them all out, but you can't hand out more. That's how many the NCAA allows you. So if all of those teams utilize all of those scholarships, that's 4,719 scholarship players at the Division I level. At the time of the reporting, by the way, this was coming from Matt. I'm not sure if it's pronounced Zenitz or Zenitz, Z-E-N-I-T-Z, but this, these... Uh, This reporting is from Matt, so thanks to Matt for his work on this. But at the time of his reporting, there were 966 scholarship players, not total players, scholarship Division I players 
in the transfer portal. And I specify all that because there were non-scholarship players and division two and three players in the portal as well. So of the approximately 4,719 scholarship players last season, at the time of this reporting, 966 of them were in the transfer portal. That's roughly 20.5% of all scholarship players at the division one level last season. 20%, that's one out of every five division one scholarship players in the transfer portal. That also equates, if you want to talk about, okay, how many is that on average per team? It's over two and a half, more than your two and a half kids in the average American family. It's 2.66 players per team team on average in the transfer portal. Obviously, Carolina is over that number at six, but still on average, 2.66 players per team in the portal. That that alone is wild, but that's what we're going to continue to see. I've been harping on it. I've been talking about it. This is the new norm of college basketball, and I know losing six, you want that to definitely be the exception, not the norm. But it, it, it just doesn't have to be because things went wrong at Carolina this year. It could be a whole host of reasons. Yes, I didn't get enough playing time, or I want to go closer to home, or my girlfriend's there, or whatever it is. It's just the way of it. And, and it's not even just at Carolina. It's at schools that performed really well this year. Just on Monday, we learned that Texas guard Arterio Morris was entering the transfer report. Like, there's going to be this year after year after year. Now, because you have teams that are higher above that average like Carolina and their and their 20 and their six transfer portal players, you're going to have some that are zero or one and, and sure that's going to happen, but you you got to expect that it's going to be something like this every year. And oh by the way, even this offseason it's not slowing down. We've got till May 11th. That's when the transfer portal closes. I mean, honestly, you can still enter after that. It's just that that's when you have to enter to be eligible for the one-time transfer status where you can transfer without having to sit out a year. So there's going to be more. Let me give you some more numbers. Last year, between April 4th and May 11th, there were 503 more players that entered in that time frame. And that was out of 1,220 total players, scholarship players, in the portal last year. So... It's not done. There's going to be more to hop in. So here's what that means for North Carolina. Here's what that means for us. There are still plenty of players to find, and there are still more yet to be found that aren't even in the portal. Carolina's got five scholarships available. It's okay to take our time a little bit. We don't want to get caught looking. We don't want to get caught with our pants down, whatever phrase you want to use, right? You, You want to make sure you get the people you want. And if you see somebody you want, go get them, right? Make it happen. But it is okay that that we've only got Pax and Wojcik at this point. There are more to come, some of whom are in the portal right now, and you hope you get some of those. But there could be more, like Pete Nance. Remember last year, we didn't get him until June 18th once he came out of the draft. So lots of possibility. We continue to wait and be patient and know that things are happening. But I know that's not easy. Let me recognize that at the same time. All right, we'll continue to talk about all of it coming up. But as for today, that's it for the show. Our guy, Coach Pat Kilby, joins us tomorrow. Can't wait for that. We will be looking at reviewing the front court from last season and what we have to look forward to ahead. You can follow the show on Twitter at Locked on Heels. Follow me at Isaac Shade. Would love to talk with you more. You can shoot me a DM. You can email the show Locked on Tar Heels at gmail.com. I get that personally. I will see that and I'll respond to it. Would love to have more conversation with you there. Don't forget to subscribe to the show. Smash the like button. Comment on the show. Would love to hear your thoughts on Jalen Withers. Should Carolina bring him in? Yes or no? Let me know. Really appreciate you hanging out with me on a Tuesday talking about Carolina athletics. Always great conversations. It's always a great day to be a Tar Heel. You know it. I know it. All right. I'll catch you guys tomorrow. But until then, peace.